Shalom family. How's everybody doing? I am your brother, Haji Go Lightly. I want to welcome you back one more time to the Go Lightly Perspective. Thank you for just having the desire to take a moment and view this video. Um, we're steadily growing, continuing to build our connection, our relationship with people, showing them our perspective that we found, not only found, yay, what we're living according to the text. And if you uh, vibrate with that and uh, move in that same understanding, big shout out to you and thank you. And even for those who do not, that's quite all right. That's not the, the prerequisite because what I only try to do is share. I want to be a part of what the father's doing in these last days. And I know that what he's doing is uniting families. He's turning the heart of the fathers back to the sons, back to the children. And I'm a father and I have children. And I have to say that my heart is definitely with them family. So we're going to talk about a few things today. We're going to talk about reparations. Reparation is a hot reparations. I should say it's a hot button issue. In, in society, even within the culture, in the Israelite tradition, when you begin to deal with it and address some things, there's uh, a, a couple understandings, a couple scriptures that you have to keep in mind, as well as be able to have uh, uh, overall context of the issue. And uh, that's just what I want to share. But uh, shout out to everybody that's alive and well. I pray that you're healthy. It's such a beautiful time to be alive, man. I, man, y'all see, I got on my uh, my traditional, my African uh, attire, my garments today. I was just really, really feeling it. I will be uh, making some more announcements going forward because I will be traveling to Africa. I'll be going to Kenya and Tanzania uh, spending some time on the motherland, uh, building connections, uh, trying to make sure that, you know, my footing is strong there as well as potentially, you know, open up some doors and I'll just, I will just leave it at that. I'm not going to go any further because it's just, it's just so much going on and we just have to think differently about the times that we're living in. Um, for you to say that you're Israel, and not be of the mindset of your fathers. Like I'm, I'm talking about a certain consciousness of being that of a pilgrim, understanding that our ancestors, they, they were almost nomads until they got to the promised land. And if you believe that this is your promised land, then so be it, uh, far be it from me to try to convince you otherwise. However, for others that have read the text and know where this thing is going, um, we probably should be putting some feelers out there in other areas. Is that all right? Is that all right, family? All right. So what I want to do is I want to pull up this article that I read uh, from The Guardian that deals with reparations. And you may say, well, why are you dealing with this, Hodge? I'm dealing with this because <clears throat> what I tend to uh, address directly is family. This conversation directly impacts family. And I'll sh show some charts, uh, some stats in regards to the wealth gap for black people or African Americans or Hebrews versus that of the European counterpart, that we understand that this wealth gap did not occur in a vacuum. It has been systematic it has been problematic for us, yet it has been beneficial for them. So when you talk about reparations, you have many that are in the in the space. I tend to value the contribution of, of Tone, a uh, great lawyer out there in L.A., Yvette Cornell, um, who does the podcast and the show, the political show, Breaking Brown. You know, they really began to give this movement some teeth a little more traction where it had more legal footing because they began to articulate and enunciate a specific claim that this was about ADOS, ADOS, the American descendants of slaves. It's about them specifically. And that uh, was, was attacked by many, many people. It was attacked by a lot of those that 
don't have blood and dirt here. What do I mean? It was attacked by many of those that come from the Caribbean, those that come from African. They looked at it as if it was sectarian, as if it was divisive. It was uh, uh, exclusive. Um, even those that, that are from here, they looked at it the same way. And I'm not saying you're wrong. What I am saying is um, those that have come here that have had that have experienced systemic racism, that have experienced uh, uh, the inability to get loans, uh, public housing, uh, uh, mortgage loans um, to live in certain areas being gentrified. I agree. You do have a claim. However, it is a separate claim. It is a different claim than those that have that are uh, the, dis the descendants of American slavery. Why? We'll read the article. I think that it was very um, 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 enlightening and thoughtful the way that they, they phrased it and the wording that they use. They use the language that, um, and I'll use the same language, that those that came here, that migrated here after the 60s, and see, I want you guys to to just let, let's not forget that the timetable that those that came here from the Caribbean, from the continent, all of this happened post 60s, post um, civil rights movement, post having dogs sick on us, post uh, Selma, uh, Selma and the uh, the Pettus Bridge, you know, post the death of Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and many of our great uh, leaders at that time. They came after that and we welcomed them, but they don't get in, in, in my opinion, just my humble perspective. They don't now as a result of migration now get a chance or have the ability to speak to the claim of those that have been here, suffered, bled, died, castrated, raped, mutilated, uh, experienced savagery on a whole nother level. Uh, they don't now get to be at the front of the line and to try to to define what claim we have. It will be the equivalent of me going to Jamaica, living there for a few years, maybe even a generation. And, and me or my sons try to tell the natives, try to tell them that we should be um, able to receive reparations from what uh, I believe it, it wasn't the Dutch. It was the English that uh, colonized Jamaica or uh, be in uh, in Nigeria or, or Ghana and to try to lay claim to their reparations uh, claim against the British to say, well, you know what? Hey, man, I ought to be included. Y'all leaving us out. They would be like, man, where, where's your blood? Where's your dirt? Your family wasn't here. You didn't experience colonization. You only came post colonization. Right. So, you know, <laughs> they will look at me like you ain't Iwe, you ain't Hausa, you're not Fulani, you're not Igbo, none of that. They will look at me in that same way. And it's the same way that it has to be regarded. It just if we just flip the roles, you know, if you look at the Puerto Ricans, the you know, Puerto Rico was colonized by um, by the Spanish for over 400 years. And then America took over after the uh, Spanish American war. Uh, you know, let's just say if, if the Spaniards had a reparations claim against, I'm sorry, if the Puerto Ricans had a, a reparations claim uh, against Spain, then I moved to Puerto Rico and say, Hey man, you ought to include me. What, what, what are y'all doing, man? It's, it's not right that you're, you're excluding me. They would look at me like I had lost my mind that I'm, I'm a, a an immigrant coming there trying to tell those that have experienced suffrages that have experienced pain trauma on you know trying to inform their decisions and we know that that's just that wouldn't fly by any means so um ados did a great job and i, I do give them credit um there's a lot of people in the black media spaces that have been doing their work not leaving them out also you know uh, in Cobra, you know, did some things. I don't think that it had as much uh, impact, but, you know, that's just my humble opinion. But moving forward, I want to share my screen. I'm going to read this article from The Guardian and maybe, um, you know, I'll put a card here 
where you can take a look at a video that I did some three or four years ago in regards to this movement, where I understood from the scriptures that there would come a time where a righteous man would stand up boldly in the face of those that did not consider his labor. And that's in uh, the wisdom of Solomon, chapter five, if you want to read that. I went through that and let me make this disclaimer before I'm misquoted and misunderstood. I'm not saying that th that the reparations that they are asserting in California is uh, uh, the fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 60. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying, it is a it is the beginning of some of the legal framework. It is the beginning of these conversations that had to be had on a higher level to show that there's, there is a specific group that deserves reparations to be repaired. And I know that, you know, I caught flack on that video from those that are within the culture and those that feel like, well, how far back do you go? What you're saying is imbecilic, it's ridiculous. And, you know, I never had any slaves and I shouldn't have to pay. Okay, that, you know, cool. That's fine. Not saying that you did. However, you benefited. Now, let's just flip it. I'm not a Ukrainian. Don't have any family member that that's from that part. But they just gave them carte blanche. They just gave them 13 billion dollars. Oh, well, they're an ally. Really? So you're saying that my people haven't been an ally to the U.S.? The fact that we've built it. You know, you asked us to. Sing the songs of Zion in a strange land. We sang for you. We danced for you. We took care of your children. We played basketball for you, football for you. We've done, we put on ties and suits, you know, for you. You tell us, well, if you dress better, you wouldn't get, uh, what do they call it? Uh, you wouldn't get picked on by the, by the police if you just dress better. If you pull your pants up. You wouldn't be profiled. That's the language. Thank you. We've done all these things, yet we're still a bottom caste, second tier system, uh, second tier citizens in the land that our forefathers built. So I want to read this article. Let me get to it. Let me share my screen. Mm -hmm. Y'all bear with me one second. Let me minimize this. And let me just take that out so I can see that I'm actually sharing it. Thank you. Mm. Let's share that. Give me one second to populate family. This was, uh, you know, California began to speak to this in a more substantive, substantive way than any other state. They were the first. And you know how they say as California goes, so goes the rest of the nation. Um, I do know that uh, reparations that are, uh, or let's just say any payments that don't include tangible resources, gold, silver, uh, land, would be um, almost going backwards for me. That's in my book. So because that's not what the scripture says that we will receive. So just consider this family. Um, this is from The Guardian. California reparations to be limited to descendants of enslaved people. Task force decides. California's first in the nation task force on reparations for African Americans has voted to direct state compensation to the descendants of enslaved and free black people who were in the United States in the 17th, I'm sorry, in the 19th century. They began to attach a time span that is not just for everybody. I think that everyone that has experienced racism has a claim. However, it's different than the claim of this group. As we continue, the group said that a compensation and restitution plan based on lineage. I talk so much about lineage in our culture. We track lineage through our fathers. 
That's why I'm so honored to be the son of William, the son of Daniel, the son of Freeman and the son of George. This is my patriarchal lineage. You can look at the book of Chronicles. You can look all throughout the scriptures. We always tracked our lineage through the father. Other cultures track their lineage through the mother. It's matriarchal. That's fine. That's neither here nor there. I'm only speaking truth to how we uh, follow lineage and how the ancient Israelites did the very same thing. And we are that people group. All right. Restitution based on lineage, as opposed to one based on race, which would have opened the possibility of reparations to a broader group, had the best chance of surviving a legal challenge. They also said that the black immigrant immigrants who had chosen to migrate to the U S in the 20th and the 21st century did not share the trauma of people who had been kidnapped and enslaved. Wow. That's strong language family that brings specificity and nuance to this legal argument. I love that. They don't have the same trauma to have been kidnapped. No, we didn't. We didn't have visas. We didn't have green cards, work visas, none of that. We didn't have passports. So if you came here that way, you have a different status, a different uh, uh, positionality than this people group who were kidnapped, abducted, and enslaved. Next paragraph, they also opened eligibility to free black people who migrated to the country in the 19th century, given possible difficulties of documenting genealogy and the risk at the time of becoming enslaved. The decision passed by a vote of five to four on Tuesday evening after a day of lively debate. I'm sure it was. It passed by a very small amount. But it passed, though. Others on the committee had argued that reparations should include all black people, regardless of lineage, who suffer from systemic racism in housing, education and employment. They also said it would be difficult to prove lineage and that enslavers often ship people to work in various plantations and in and outside the country. I agree with that. We do have Afro uh, Mexicans. We have Afro Caribbeans, we have Afro um, uh, Dominicans, Cubans, uh, Puerto Ricans. We have that. They were shipped out. Absolutely. But it's a different claim. It's a different uh, mindset. It's a different thing that they're putting forth uh, for this people group. The two year reparation task force was created in 2020, making California the only state to move ahead with the plan to study. I'm sorry, to move ahead with a study and plan with the mission to study the institution of slavery and its harms and to educate the public about its findings. So uh, let's go down and, and I'll read a couple things. Um, I'm going to skip a couple paragraphs. Longtime advocates had spoken to the need for multifaceted remedies for for related yet separate harms such as slavery, Jim Crow laws, mass incarceration and redevelopment that resulted in displacement of black communities. You know, we can look back at redlining our people experience, just the damage of sharecropping, putting our people on a trail of tears. I saw that uh, 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 President Biden said that he's against any reparations package that did not include the Native Americans. It's like, wait a minute. This would be double dipping for them because they were very specific in ensuring that our people receive nothing in terms of their reparations, uh, in terms of their compensation. When they got casinos, free education, uh, not being taxed, they got land throughout Oklahoma, all of that. Florida. Um, uh, the Midwest, uh, uh, um, what is it? Arizona, Nevada, they made sure to exclude our people. So why is it that we would include them in our reparations package? I'm not saying that they didn't experience trauma. I'm not saying that they did not experience harm. However, did they not receive compensation? Hmm. I'm just saying. 
Uh, compensation could include free college assistance, buying homes and launching businesses and grants to churches and community organizations. The advocate says advocates say, so you start to see how they start to muddle it down. Yeah. Yeah. We'll allow you guys to go get free college and we'll help you buy some homes and maybe launch some businesses, but this will get muddy really, really quickly. Because we know that once you get the bureaucrats involved, it'll go from being about ADOS or descendants of slaves to being about black and brown people. We have to be more inclusive. But I'll leave it for you to go and uh, please take a look at this and maybe I'll, I'll um, add it in the description because it's very, very timely uh, for our people to consider these things. Um, because there is, and, and I think that it's time for them to do so as well, because there's just a huge wealth gap. I want to show, let me show that, um, this chart about the wealth gap and why this should be considered family. Um, Let me stop this. Oh, I have to stop sharing. I'm learning. Uh, I'm, I'm getting better, family. I'm getting better. We're going to share this window. All right. This is the black wealth gap. Try to make that a little bit larger so you can see it. I pulled this data. Well, I pulled this article on um, black wealth, uh, um, sorry, black demographics pulled the data and they pulled it uh, straight from the U.S. Census. Um, actually, uh, the Federal Reserve 2019 survey of consumer finances. Um, they do a lot of credible, very relevant, very powerful um, research. And, you know, it's easy for you to go and grab to try to um, understand the phenomenon that we're experiencing being here in the U.S. And if you don't understand that, you'll make decisions that are not based in truth. It could be based on emotion when emotion and social media may say that a lot of our people are getting over and that there is no wealth gap. There is no systemic racism, but the numbers show something else. So if you look at this, uh, this black slash white wealth gap. The uh, family median net worth, assets and valuable holdings minus debts. So that, you know, that would be all of your assets. You know, if you do own your home, if you do own your car, if you have stocks, if you have uh, uh, money in the bank, if you have gold, you have silver, you have, you know, many different assets and you subtract. Maybe you don't own your home. Maybe you mortgage. Credit card debt. Once you subtract those things, I want you guys to look at this number in 2019 right here. It says that black families would only have a net worth of twenty four thousand one hundred dollars. And you compare that to uh, European families, white families that have a net worth of almost one hundred and ninety thousand dollars. It is a huge gap. That is very, very difficult to grasp. They said that I don't even want to quote it, but it would take generations to overcome this generations to overcome it. So this is, you know, one of the reasons why reparations is so significant and so impactful for our people. I know that many people just equate it to um, uh, private or, or personal choices. I'm not one of those because I, I understand the system that has been against us. And if you do, I'm sure that you will draw the very same conclusion. Um, if you go back to 1989 here on the chart family, our our people only had uh, almost, uh, well, actually $8,552 in net worth versus in 1989, our European counterparts, they had $143,563 as their net worth. So not a lot has changed. Now, when you factor in inflation, that's huge. I don't have the inflation numbers, not even going to try to quote it. But um, if you factor in inflation, these numbers 
here are probably consistent with where we are now. So this is why we say reparations is key. Now, granted, I, I don't presume that they're going to just give us anything. I'm just sharing this so that you are aware and you understand our perspective on it. I'm like I said, I will tag the video that I did. I did a three part series on ADOS and why I felt like it was credible and relevant. And uh, I still feel the same way. There are some small differences there. I don't feel, I didn't feel like it was Isaiah 60 then or some of the other scriptures, um, Isaiah 43. I did not feel like it was that. However, it is just giving us the fame framework that we need. Now, when we say black families only have twenty four thousand one hundred dollars in in uh, total uh, wealth, that is a, a staggering number compared to the one eighty nine. Let me pull up one more stat for you, family, if you would. And then I am going to be done. I want to share one more stat. I may share two, share two more. Um, let's look at the poverty weight of, of our people. Let me just share this window, family. Hold on one second. Let's share that. I want you guys to consider the, let's make that a little bit larger. Let's look at these stats once again, again, from black uh, uh, demographics dot com. Black poverty rate, Hebrew poverty, poverty weight. If you look at what I've highlighted in yellow here, maybe I need to. Yeah, let me go a little bit smaller so we can. I want to be able to see that. Yeah. What I have highlighted here in yellow, a percentage of black families in poverty, 18.5 percent versus 26.7 percent. Uh, I'm sorry, versus 9.3 percent, which makes sense when you look at the stat that I just showed of the wealth gap. They simply have more money. And a lot of this is generational wealth that has been passed down systematically. Um, and versus those that have been made, as, as Tone said, a, a pariah, you know, a, a contagion to wealth where we don't have the opportunity to build businesses because we don't have the economic floor that were given to many of our counterparts, like the Irish, um, like the, the, the Jewish, like those that are um, uh, Italian. They were given many, many um, uh, financial instruments to try to help them to raise their status, we receive none of that. This is not, anyway, let me keep going. Uh, if you look at married couples and families and uh, that are at or below the poverty line, um, there's a huge difference between those that are, uh, the families that are impoverished, just all, all the families together, but then you look at those that are married. It goes from 18.5% to 6.7% which is a, a significant reduction just in marriage. You're stronger together. That's why we advocate for families on this channel and try to share our perspective. I've been married for 18 years now, be 19 years this year. I have uh, many sons and some credibility in the space. Um, now, if you look at those married couples that have children that are under the age of 18 is 8.7% percent of those. So it's a lot of children in that number. Now, family, let's just jump down. That's the last thing. I won't review the entire chart. Look at the females with no spouses. May have never been married. We can pull that data that uh, black women are only have like a, a 25 percent chance of actually being married. And then if you throw in divorce, it's even higher. So um, those that were married and now divorced could fall in this female with no spouse category. It's just um, you don't have the same financial strength as a family. You just don't. You can say that you don't need a man. You can say that uh, black women are doing good by themselves. And I'd rather do bad on my own, you know, which is 
the result of a lot of programming that they received in the 80s and the 90s through through media, through television, through movies, through books that they read. You know, the data is saying that ain't the case. You're not doing well. Also, I wish I had the article um, showing that in Washington, um, that black women are the number one demographic that are going that are experiencing evictions. Uh, maybe I'll bring that up some other time. But look, look, look that article up that black women are the number one demographic that are being evicted. A lot of these single parent, single women, head of households, you know, this is not working for our culture on many, many levels. I'm not even going to go there, but it's not working. And let's look at this stat right here. Females with no spouse, 30 percent of them are living at or below the poverty line. 30 percent and 39 percent of that 30 percent have children under the 18. What do you think is going to be the future of these children? You know, you look at the stats and the data on uh, children that grew up in single parent households, that they have an increased likelihood of, of incarceration, increased likelihood of fighting and, and not doing well in school, uh, not matriculating to college, uh, being a high school dropout, being a teen, uh, a teen mom, just as a result of not having uh, a father or man in the house or not being married. I pull that to show to say that. Prayerfully, you know, those that follow the vibration that we rocking in that have a curious connection, a righteous connection of spirit, you're seeing it. It's never what the Most High has advocated for. And if he didn't advocate for it, we should not advocate for it because we end up becoming a cursed thing. Because the mentality of our people, the mindset of our people. You have to ask yourself, well, where did this come from? Where did this overall mindset come from? It came from those that oppress us. It came from those that benefit from us being in the position that we're in. And that's why we have to ask ourselves really, really strong questions. We have to bring our strong reasons in order to adopt the righteous mentality and a mindset that is not colonized, that is not uh, that did not come from this, this colonized or the, this slave mindset. That is deeply rooted in American culture, which is just a remnant of slave culture. So having a systemic overthrow, having a sincere brainwashing <laughs> is key for our people, family. So that's all I wanted to share that, uh, you know, I'll be speaking more about this because the time is now the time for us, especially in this season of Passover, where we're looking back over our lives. We're trying to get all the leaven out of our life. There's so much leaven there. There's so many things that have been told to us that we've never questioned that now we're beginning to question to say, well, maybe this doesn't have the value that I thought that it once did. And be unapologetic about that conclusion and then find a group, find elders that can help you in advancing in that area, help you in advancing in, in recovering, discovering and then controlling your righteous mind. Because it's not going to be easy there. You know, we're troubled on every side, yet we're not perplexed. And, and you'll be less perplexed if you're able to find a group. So that's what we advocate for. We advocate for family. We advocate that the most revolutionary thing that a man can do in today's time is align his family in the patriarchal structure that the Most High has told us to do. But when I leave, you remember I said with the last words on my lips that I am a revolutionary. You know, it, it didn't it didn't play right. But, you know, I'll insert it later. You know, we we have to be revolutionary in our mindset, family. This changes everything. Patriarchy changes everything. That's what the stats were for, to show that, you know, without a man being at the head of the household and not moving in the vibration that the most high has said, 
we end up doing something that is antagonistic to what he would have us do. So love you, family. May the most high bless you, strengthen you. And I will be back soon with another video. But until then, may the most high bless you and strengthen you. Shalom, shalom.